Live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News at 5 starts now. Too soon, one of the Q-Line streetcars gets tagged with graffiti, and it's more than a year away from seeing its first passenger. Honoring an icon, you're looking live as the public pays tribute to Mike Illich at a special memorial today. Well, the window on our glorious sunshine is about to close. Will we get it back before the end of the week? All right, Ben, but we begin with breaking news. We're following from Detroit's west side, where we've learned a Detroit police officer fatally shot a suspect after he tried to grab his gun. New details continuing to emerge from that scene on Detroit's west side today. It happened right at the intersection of Otsego and Webb Street. That's near I-96 and the Davison. Coco McAvoy is there this evening. And Coco, what have you been able to find out so far? Kimberly and Jason details still emerging after this officer involved shooting and the task force consisting of the Detroit Police Department, the DEA, FBI and Michigan State Police Department still out here investigating, combing through evidence and conducting interviews after an officer involved shooting. Again, we're very early in this investigation. Officers blocking off Webb Street on Detroit's west side to piece together exactly what happened after an officer involved shooting in the area. A shooting they say started as a traffic stop when officers saw vehicles speeding down Broad Street. Uh, they initiated contact with the vehicle by turning on their emergency lights to initiate a traffic stop. In doing so, the suspect took off at a high rate of speed. Police say that suspect ended up crashing into a utility pole, then got out of the vehicle and started running. The suspect tried or at least got his hands on the officer's weapon. There may have been a brief struggle at that point. One shot was fired. Until the suspect and the officer got to a vacant abandoned home near Webb Street. That's when a struggle took place. The officer was giving uh, the suspect direction to get down so he could prepare to handcuff the suspect. Uh, the suspect uh, lunged in the direction of the officer. And what we believe is that he attempted to uh, secure the officer's weapon. One fatal shot was fired, striking the suspect in the lower torso. So now officers are working to positively identify the suspect as they continue to sort through this investigation. And police say that suspect who is believed to be roughly 25 years old right now, they're trying to figure out if he had any warrants out for his arrest. They're trying to determine why he would run away from that traffic stop and he was pronounced dead here at the scene after the officer involved shooting reporting live this afternoon. I'm Coco McAvoy local Four. back to you now Coco. Did the chief say anything about the vehicle that the suspect was driving? Were there any clues in there? So Kimberly, they say the first thing they were trying to determine is whether or not that vehicle was stolen. They say that the vehicle was not stolen. However, the car is registered under a different owner and they're now interviewing that person who says they, has, they have no idea who that man is, but they're trying to figure out how this all happened. And they say they are now continuing to conduct interviews and they're going to try to notify next of kin. Yeah, a lot of questions to still be answered. Coco, thanks. Boy, from those howling winds last night to sunshine in the middle of February today. It's glorious, isn't <laughs> it? It's practically unheard of in February in southeast Michigan. Let's get over to Ben. Yeah, this winter we haven't gotten to see a map like this much in the last uh, several weeks, but it is beautiful bright sunshine all over the place out there. That's allowed temperatures to get above average this afternoon. We're still 43 in Metro and that's coming off of our daytime high, which was right at 45. Some 30s out here towards Mount Clemens and Port Huron, but we will do the 40s again tomorrow before things start to cool down heading in to the middle of the week. Beautiful sunset tonight as the sun sets just after six o'clock. Temperatures falling out of the 40s and we'll be at 36 under mostly clear skies for the entire night. We'll look at some pretty significant changes, both on the good and not so good end in the seven day forecast coming up, guys. All right, Ben, a scare at a Warren beverage company this morning as an ammonia leak forced the building to be evacuated. You're looking at the beverage, uh, the Sundance beverage company on East Nine Mile, where emergency crews showed up around 10 this morning. One woman was taken to the hospital after breathing the fumes. We don't know her condition, but we're told she is stable. The leak has been sealed in that building since reopened. Crews continue to work on fixing a water leak that's causing more steam than usual in downtown Detroit. The biggest problem area over the last month has been on Gratiot Avenue near Russell. Firefighters told a business owner there the steam has the potential to cause a large sinkhole if not fixed. 
Crews tell us they expect the valve causing the leak to be replaced by the end of the week. Detroit educators and lawmakers want the state to toss out any plan to close failing schools and instead work with them to create a better solution. In January, the state identified Michigan public schools that have ranked in the bottom 5% for 2014, 15, and 16. As many as 24 of 119 Detroit schools could be shut down as soon as this summer if they remain among the state's lowest performers. The possibility has alarmed Detroit officials, so they gathered at the Brightmore Community Center to discuss concerns. One of the things as a council member I can tell you that's important is that we don't continue to close schools, yeah. that we don't have vacant buildings. Yeah. When you have vacant buildings, you're asking for trouble. State Rep Sylvia Santana echoed a similar concern, saying the state should conduct closing impact studies to see how the community would be impacted before shutting anything down. All right, now more than 100,000 people living below this dam have been evacuated over the very real fear that it could break. This is happening at the Oroville Dam it's north of Sacramento. Rain has left water levels at record highs, damaging a spillway and sending water over an emergency wall. Jennifer Bjorklund is there tonight as crews work to keep the water away. The emergency spillway at one of the country's largest dams is in a state of emergency. They've got their work cut out for them filling that. Water levels in Lake Oroville have dropped enough to stop the water from lapping over an eroded emergency spillway, easing some of the panic overnight that sent nearly 200,000 residents evacuating to higher ground. There's no water is flowing over the emergency spillway at this time. Late Sunday, crews spotted a 200-foot-long, 30-foot-deep hole in the lip of the dam spillway. Engineers were told the dam could fail within the hour. A controlled release of water this morning is relieving pressure on the dam and buying officials much-needed time as engineers and crews repair the breach in the main spillway and ease the erosion on the emergency spillway. That's the immediate concern. Our uh, infrastructure is holding up very well, even though it's been damaged. We just hope and pray that uh, that holds. Tom Schultz is a walnut farmer and president of the Feather River Levee Board. He says in 40 years of living in the area, they've never been in this situation. The river can hold that water, but if there happens to be a breach of the dam, then it's a whole different story. More than 500 people showed up at this evacuation center in Chico and made do as organizers ran out of cots and blankets. The tractor trailer with additional supplies got stuck in gridlock traffic. I'm stressful and crazy. Stress that rolls downstream through dozens of communities living in fear of a 30-foot high wall of water coming through now after years of drought. The crews here are making the most of this clear weather to shore things up and also drop the lake's level. But with a forecast of three to five inches of rain for later on this weekend into the weekend, they could find themselves right back where they started in just a few days' time. I'm Jennifer Bjorklin in Oroville, California, NBC News. Now, police say despite numerous rumors, there have been no reports of any looting since that evacuation. A public memorial honoring Mike Illich has been busy all day at Comerica Park as well-wishers pay their respects to a true Detroit icon. Steve Garajola is there tonight, and Steve, more proof of what Mr. I meant to this town. Boy, Jason, that's the truth. Uh, we're really in a transition period right now. This afternoon, very busy. A lot of office buildings around Comerica Park. A lot of people came over this afternoon. I suspect this evening when folks get home from work, many will decide they want to come down to Comerica Park. When you saw the variety of people who were this afternoon, you really got a clear picture of just how many lives Mike Illich touched. Some of these visitors knew Mike Illich, or had at least met him, but most did not. Still, they wanted to come here today to share a memory, a moment, an inspiration because of his part in their life. Holden Farrow is a student at Wayne State's Mike Illich School of Business. He's not only done so much for the business school, but for this entire city as well. And I just really appreciate what, what he's done. Ellen Yergolite works for the Tigers now. Her working life began in a Little Caesars pizza shop. Little Caesars was one of my favorite jobs, and it's a great first job to have, and I feel like not a lot of people can say that. So it speaks volumes about the organization and, and the man who ran it. It's all because of him that I'm happy and successful and <laughs> love my job. Jake Walken was 16 when he got a job making Pizza Pizza. Um, I was young. It was just a very part-time job for me. No big deal, a little cash in the pocket. Once I really understood 
how much effort and, and passion that Mr. I put into this, it inspired me. It was my flame, my inspiration, my motivation, my drive, my heart. It's what kept me going. Yes, he built an iconic pizza franchise, two world-class sports franchises, restaurants, theaters, a multi-billion dollar empire. But most of all, he touched lives and really made a difference. Boy, there's no doubt about that. So many warm, wonderful messages left already on the board, and I'm sure so many yet to come. Uh, of course, the public viewing is on Wednesday afternoon. That's across the street over at the Fox Theater, noon until 8 on Wednesday. This is a much different experience. This is really a chance for people to leave memories and messages. All of these messages will, of course, be shared eventually with the Illich family. Uh, Kimberly, Jason, back to you. Yeah, and a lot of room left on that board. Steve, any idea how long they're going to keep that open tonight? Well, yeah, I wondered about how late it was going to be. They brought in some uh, like stadium lights on each side and they tell me it's going to be 24 seven. Uh, anytime anybody wants to come down here, there will be security guards here on place to make sure everything stays as it is because it's a beautiful setup. But uh, anytime someone wants to come over between now and when the uh, the viewing is on Wednesday, I think you'll have that opportunity. I think fans would love that a really cool way to pay their respects. All right, Steve, thanks. A lot of people also go into our website, click on Detroit.com and reading all the posts there and on our Facebook page. So certainly uh, such an outpouring. Yeah, really, yeah. really is. All right. Here's consumer investigator Hank Winchester with a look at what he's working on tonight. Hank. Flint and a brand new battle between the mayor there and the governor. And this one may take you by surprise. Help me Hank live tonight with that story. All right, Hank, also at five, it could be President Trump's first real test since taking office. New tonight, who launched this missile and why it has many nations on edge. But first, what police are saying tonight after someone tagged one of the Q-Line streetcars. That's coming up next. Tonight, new at six. Their high-rise apartment building has no working elevator and many of them can't climb the stairs. New at six, how these Detroit seniors are coping and why it's taking so long to fix the problem. Plus, the big day is almost here for the man known as White Boy Rick. Kevin Dietz has a look at what's in store tomorrow and Rick Wershey's best shot yet at freedom. The queue line isn't even up and running yet, and already someone went and tagged it with graffiti. And this is what somebody spray painted on the streetcar overnight, the letters A-C-A-B. Coco McAvoy is following that story tonight. And Coco, is there any idea who did this? Kimberly and Jason, police do not know who did this, but as you said, that person wrote the acronym ACAB, which police say is an anti-police message that we cannot repeat on TV. But residents say they're upset. They say it's such a shame that someone would already vandalize the queue line before it even started running. Just the fact that you would disgrace something like that in the city of Detroit is in the process of coming back is disheartening. You can understand resident Derek Boston's frustration after police say a man tagged one of the brand new Q line cars with a derogatory police term. We believe it to be used by a particular group of graffiti vandals. Uh, so uh, it's only a matter of time before we uh, identify these individuals. Police are planning to do so by reviewing video from the several surveillance cameras in the area. Talking with uh, local businesses to see if we have any additional video that we can pull. Though residents say they need to do something and find out who did it. Some weren't surprised. And I said, you know, it's only a matter of time before they start vandalizing them. But that doesn't mean Cheryl Joseph isn't upset about it and has one question for the person who did this. We got to spend some more money to fix them. And police are certain they'll track down the person responsible and they will face charges. Definitely affects the quality of life. Uh, we're, you know, working to bring this city um, back and send a message to uh, our residents and uh, individuals who visit this city that the city is safe. And crews are now trying to clean the vandalism off of the streetcar. And of course, they're also trying to figure out who's responsible for this. As you heard, they're checking those surveillance cameras. And we reached out to the queue line, but they said they did not want to comment on the situation. Reporting live this afternoon, I'm Coco McAvoy, Local 4. And Coco, you mentioned that the person will face charges. Did police discuss what charges they may face if they find the person? Yes, the sergeant we spoke to said, of course, that person will be facing the charge of malicious destruction of property. But she said also they believe they have enough to charge that person with a felony.
Hopefully they find that person or somebody knows something and we'll turn them in. Coco, thanks. For the second time in less than a week, the Northeast has been hit by a major snowstorm. Yeah, big one. Winter storm warnings in effect across New England today, where more than two feet of snow possible. In New Jersey, a woman had to be rescued from her car after sliding into a pond. And in Connecticut, icy roads there have caused more than 100 accidents. The snow has also caused major problems at airports, where nearly 1,000 flights were canceled today. We've seen plenty of that, but just not today. Not today. I'm not wishing bad weather on anybody, but look at us. Yay. <laughs> hey, <laughs> we're not dealing with that. Michigan. <laughs> it's good that we're on the other end of the, yeah. the stick, so to speak. But you know, the, the worst thing we had to deal with really was the winds. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, from yesterday, uh, and those wind speeds anywhere between uh, 47 miles an hour was the uh, fastest that we clocked. Uh, that was out in Harrison Township at Selfridge. Troy, 47. In fact, just about everybody saw gusts over 40 miles an hour yesterday. Uh, just check no power outages still remain uh, from those speeds. And in fact, the winds have really died down a lot, about 5 to 10 miles an hour out there compared to what we had yesterday. So we finally got it where the winds have calmed down, the sun is out, and the temperatures are warmer than average all at the same time. Uh, and it's beautiful out there. 43 current temperature, even with a 10 mile an hour wind, wind chill 37, which is still, as we said at four, above our normal high for the day. Uh, so it definitely feels very unfebruary like. We're watching our next system, which is out here in the northern part of Minnesota. This is not going to be a big deal, but you can see some precipitation up there towards Duluth. It's going to be out ahead of a cold front, which is on its way down here. So skies are going to remain mostly clear tonight. We will see the clouds increase tomorrow. Tomorrow. And then we'll be a couple snow showers scattered around during the day on Tuesday. Not going to amount to much as far as accumulation goes. And then once that front passes, that's really the last chance that we're going to see a precipitation for the week. We will have to at least deal with temperatures back towards average for the middle part of the week. But as high pressure settles in towards Friday, that's going to warm numbers back up. We'll get to the 40s on Friday and Wait till you see what we've got coming for the weekend. 28 tonight for the overnight low. Sky's mostly clear, and those winds uh, will die down tonight, but pick back up as we get into the uh, daytime hours tomorrow. Here's your four zone forecast as we break down high temperatures tomorrow. They're going to be very similar to what we saw today. 45 in the city. Livonia, you'll be at 45. Trenton, same number. One of our warmest numbers is going to be 46, so not a whole lot different than our metro zone, and that's going to be down near the state line from Monroe all the way down to Morency. West zone, high temperatures tomorrow, uh, just barely in the 40s in Genesee County, ranging to the mid 40s down here towards Chelsea, Ann Arbor, Canton, and Manchester, and a couple 30s out there, and that's going to be in Santa Lake County. Marlette, Sandusky, and Lexington all in the upper 30s, low 40s elsewhere across the north zone. So do expect to see at least some sunshine to start the day, and then those clouds start a uh, moving in ahead of some snow showers again Tuesday evening, but not going to be a big deal. Once we pass the 30s there midweek, 40s Friday, Saturday, Sunday and Monday. Look at that high temperatures in the 50s. It's coming with sunshine. Even those morning lows are going to stay above freezing, at least in our metro zone for that three day stretch. So I'm sure there'll be a lot of <clears throat> sick days. <laughs> yeah, Maybe it doesn't look like February. That. That's for sure. We'll take it. All right, Ben, thank you. Is your smartphone ruining your love life? Ahead here at 5, how technology could play a key role in wrecking relationships. And also the one easy thing you can do to keep it from happening to you. The first tragedy on the slopes. The key warning skiers missed that ended up turning into a deadly mistake when we come back. The Detroit. In the French Alps, at least four people are dead and five others missing after being buried today by an avalanche. That avalanche measured at least 400 meters wide. The resort had a high avalanche risk alert in effect and warned skiers not to venture off the path. Currently, 40 rescuers are searching for the missing five, but say there is little hope of finding them alive. The avalanche risk alert remains in effect this evening. Dylan Roof, the man sentenced to death for shooting and killing nine parishioners at a Charleston church in 2015, wants a new trial. Legal counsel for the 22-year-old arguing the crime was confined to South Carolina, so federal prosecutors lacked jurisdiction. The attorneys say since the case did not warrant federal prosecution, it needs to be retried with state prosecutors instead. The judge overruled a similar argument last year. North Korean state television showed today the test firing of a new type of medium to long range ballistic missile. South Korean military sources say the missile reached an altitude of 340 miles, landing in the water between Korea and Japan. 
North Korea has conducted five nuclear tests, including two last year, in violation of United Nations resolutions expressly prohibiting the nation from pursuing a nuclear arsenal. Disney World is increasing its ticket prices again. <laughs> <laughs> Disney announcing, because they need the money, Disney announcing the change today saying the price hike is actually part of an ongoing effort to prevent overcrowding. Going forward, value days at the Magic Kingdom will cost $107 for adults and $101 for kids. That's a $2 increase from previous prices. During regular park times, visitors will now have to pay $5 more per person, with adult tickets rising to $115. New at 5:30. An industry 4.0. It's a new term you may not have heard of. It includes virtual reality or robotics with safety measures. All of it are things that big three suppliers need to understand. This event is doing that for them. We'll explain what's all going on. Trade and immigration, big issues with Canada's Prime Minister in Washington today. Flint's mayor blasting the governor a brand new battle over water bills in a city with tainted water. I'm Hank Winchester. We'll explain you tonight. Live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News at 530 starts now. No relief in Flint. Two weeks from now, Flint residents will be forced to pay their full water bills, even though the water coming out of the tap still isn't safe to drink. Thanks for being with us for the news here at 530. Water credits for Flint residents were supposed to end in March. But in a letter sent to Flint Mayor Karen Weaver, the state now says those credits end in February, just two weeks from now. Let's get to consumer investigator Hank Winchester. Hank, this has to be a surprise. It certainly is to the mayor, to the entire uh, leadership there in the city of Flint, Jason and Kimberly. The mayor saying that she's very upset with the governor and she wants a meeting face to face to hash this one out. Flint, the water is still not safe to drink without a filter, but despite that, residents will now be billed again. Water credits were told being pulled and Flint's mayor not happy about it. We know that there's money there. There's a great rainy day fund that the state has, and that's why we've said that we deserve more as a result of it's not like they don't have money. The mayor's team worried that without those credits, which were to be carried through to the end of March, that it will not only create more problems and confusion, but also financial hardships for those who need it most. We really feel also that the loss of the credits at this time will pose a hardship to our customers. You know, every month counts, and we are looking for those credits through the 31st of March. Water quality has been improving in the city of Flint, but leaders say you should not drink the water without a filter. The mayor saying she will soon meet with the governor to hash out the water credit issue, but insiders say don't expect a change coming from Lansing. We told him that this was important and we need to have this conversation. And if we don't meet by the end of this week, we will be meeting early next week to get our issues um, addressed. Now that credit issue, that's been going on in Flint for quite a while, especially once this whole thing was first exposed uh, more than a year ago. Uh, you heard the, the mayor there in that story too. She says there's money in Lansing, there's a rainy day fund, there's plenty of cash. The people of Flint need it. Well, now she's gonna argue that out with the governor. We're live here tonight. Hank Winchester, back to you. Yeah, they also need the testing. What's the latest on that? Will they be doing any more testing soon there, Hank? They are, Jason. They're keeping a close eye on it. Things, as we've been reporting, trending in the right direction. More testing expected next week. When we have those numbers, we'll release them to you. All right, sounds good. And we will see what happens with these credits as well. All right, Hank Winchester, appreciate it. In Washington today, Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau made a visit to the White House and obviously the big talk centered around President Trump's travel ban. All of that going on as reports say that the president's national security advisor, Mike Flynn, could be on his way out. Tracy Potts is following all of it for us today from Washington. Kimberly, good evening. Canada's Prime Minister spending the back half of his day on Capitol Hill after spending time at the White House with President Trump in their first joint appearance. They focused a lot on jobs and trade, but the real disconnect between these two countries is happening at the border. In their first meeting, President Trump and Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau agreed to work together to create jobs, but expressed differing opinions on border security. I said at the beginning, we are going to get the bad ones, uh, the really bad ones. We're getting them out. 
And that's exactly what we're doing. We continue to pursue our policies of, of uh, openness uh, towards immigration refugees without compromising security. Trudeau is offering to accept refugees into his country while the president's temporary travel ban remains on hold in the courts. Today, Trudeau said he wasn't in Washington to lecture the U.S. leader on how to keep his people safe. While the two leaders talked about border issues, Democrats called on the president to fire National Security Advisor Mike Flynn. Misleading the country on a subject this serious, uh, if those allegations are true, he has got to go. Flynn is under fire for discussing sanctions with Russian leaders before the president took office and reportedly misleading Vice President Pence about the conversation. If he did lie to the vice president, then he should go. Well, I think the key question here is, uh, did President Trump know what Mike Flynn was up to? And if he did, then they're going to have to move this along quietly. White House aides deny Flynn's on the verge of being fired. Questions about those conversations with Director Flynn and the Russian officials, part of the larger investigation here into whether Russia tried to influence the presidential election. From Washington, Tracy Potts, Local 4. All right, Tracy, and later tonight, the Senate is expected to confirm Steve Mnuchin. That's President Trump's pick for Treasury Secretary. Jerry Sandusky's adopted adult son is charged with child sexual abuse today. According to court records, 41-year-old Jeffrey Sandusky was charged on 14 counts, including criminal solicitation and corruption of minors. He was arraigned today and bail was set at $200,000. This comes more than five years after his father, the former Penn State assistant coach, was first arrested. The elder Sandusky is serving a lengthy prison sentence for the sexual abuse of 10 boys. In the wake of the EpiPen controversy, another astronomical price hike. The price of opioid antidote Evzio leaps more than 600%. Evzio contains a drug that saves the lives of people who are overdosing. The FDA-approved medication is designed to be used by people who don't have medical training like police officers and families who have relatives with substance abuse problems. The price for Evzio jumped from $690 in 2014 to $4,500 today. A friendly warning tonight to manufacturing suppliers, don't get left behind. That's the message from an event today aimed at making sure smaller suppliers are keeping up with technology changes. And as Nick Monticelli reports, it can almost be overwhelming for companies that have been doing the same thing for years. So let me give you an example of what they're talking about here. Take, for instance, the robots you've seen on the floors of GM or FCA or Ford, the giant cages where robots are. They take up a lot of room. New technology has things like this, where if you walk in front of it and you hit it, it will automatically stop and say that it's got a protective setup. This robot can be used in the medical field. All of this are examples of what's being called Industry 4.0, the world of manufacturing, meaning the world of data and technology. The laser scanners look for obstacles and then route around the obstacles to its final location. Today, a group called Automation Alley held this technology industry outlook inside of the Detroit Institute of Arts. We have all the big players coming together. Tom Kelly is the executive director of Automation Alley and admits some tier two and tier three auto suppliers technologically are falling behind. I might be a manufacturer that used to bend metal and that's what I did and I know really well how to bend metal. The OE comes along and says, you got to put a sensor on that. Now I need an electrical engineer. I need to understand the data that's going to be generated. Who owns the data? That is what all of this is for. Robots, virtual reality, and more. But most importantly, how it can apply to individual businesses. More than two-thirds of our business is in automotive. Kathy Laird is with the automotive division of Goodwill. Yes, Goodwill. They don't just collect and sell clothes. They also build components for cars. And events like this make them think about their long-term goals. Like you go back and think about your strategic plan, right? And say, how am I going to have enough resources? How am I going to have the, the skill sets on my team to stay with this? But the good news is, despite the don't fall behind warning, there are answers. As long as companies are willing to ask the questions. It's a problem in getting them to focus on the future because the orders and the money and the, and the, the production is so good today. At the DIA, Nick Monticelli. Local 4.
Across Michigan this Monday, we're following stories from the state capitol in Lansing and Houghton in the UP. But we want to begin up in Bay City. That's where a toxicology report shows a mother had a blood alcohol level four times the legal limit when she drove the wrong way on I-75 back in December. Police say 38-year-old Jessica Leitner had a BAC of 0.352 when she crashed head on with another driver back on December 27th. Leitner was killed in the crash, as was 83 year old George Garski, who was driving the other car. Leitner's four month old son was in the car during that crash. He was hurt, but is okay. In Haunton, the uh, U.S. Coast Guard saved two people who fell through ice on a frozen lake. The incident happened on Portage Lake, which feeds right into Lake Superior. According to the Coast Guard, that's where a man and woman fell through the ice Friday afternoon. Both the man and woman were able to get out of the water on their own, but were trapped on thin ice. When rescue crews arrived, the woman suffered minor injuries, but is expected to be okay. And in Lansing, a Michigan agency is seeking public comment on a proposed set of standards for people who can't afford attorneys. The standards include minimum education and training for attorneys, the initial client review, retention of experts, and the first appearance before a judge. The Michigan Supreme Court conditionally approved the standards last year, but now they need to be approved by the State Department of Licensing and Regulatory Affairs. I will safe to say you can call it Christmas for cookie lovers. This morning, volunteers were busy loading up this year's shipment of Girl Scout cookies, and our Kim DiGiulio got the assignment that uh, a lot of people around here wanted. <laughs> Well, it's the best time of the year for cookie lovers like me. Girl Scout cookies are in, and of course, everyone has their favorite. Tagalongs, by far. This dulcy doll. Tagalongs. Tree foils. Tagalongs. Peanut butter and chocolate. Can't go wrong with that. <laughs> Even though we can't all agree on the best kind, we can all agree that these cookies are amazing. I can eat a whole box in one sitting. <laughs> Here, I can grab them for you, man. All this week, volunteers will be loading up their cars with the cookies to distribute to the Girl Scouts who've worked so hard to sell them. I will have a total of 167 cases. Uh, so yeah, my garage will be pretty full. <laughs> Just today in Dearborn, 6,500 cases were delivered at Levagood Park. That's $312,000 worth of cookies. We get to have the girls count the money. We get to have the girls set a goal. Cookie lovers all across the United States get excited for these cookies each year, but it's the hardworking Girl Scouts that really benefit from these cookies. They uh, represent such a good cause. You know, it's young girls um, kind of learning business for themselves, learning responsibility, learning how to manage money. And now the wait is almost over. Those tagalongs, thin mints, and Samoas will be at your door soon enough. And while everyone has their favorite cookie, year after year, the most popular selling cookie is this one right here, the Thin Mints. Can I take these to go? <laughs> Reporting from Dearborn, Kim DiGiulio, Local 4. Bringing those back to the station right I now. I didn't see them anywhere in the newsroom, <laughs> so clearly either. those went home with her. I ordered some, so hopefully they'll, uh, they'll come pretty soon here. Nobody likes my do -si dos I worship those I know, I, You know, they're okay. I don't know the new names. I like the Thin Mints and the Peanut Butter Patties, which I don't know what they're called now yeah, anymore. Yeah, uh, I forget. But, uh, <laughs> yum. Just, we'll, we'll, we'll taste them all. The Hubble Telescope capture, captures an incredible moment. Ahead here at 530, what's happening in this picture that's seldom seen by the human eye. And the investigation into the death of this man right here takes a bizarre twist. New tonight, the controversial organization he's tied to and the arrest police just made in this case. But first is social media and your smartphone killing your relationship. The easy way to keep romance alive in the age of technology. That's coming up next. Karen? We use it to soothe pesky cold symptoms. When abused, the consequences can be very dangerous. It's a big problem, especially with younger younger folks. Coming up tomorrow at 5, the warning signs your child is using an over-the-counter drug to get high. One, two, three. New at 6. It is the sad passing of the man who gave us this ballpark. Pretty soon, there won't be any areas that are not flourishing. It's not too far off. So did Mike Illich think much about his legacy, about what this park will mean to this town? And will his name be associated with it in the years to come? He had an answer for that. We'll bring it to you ahead.
Plus, the type of injuries Detroiters are more likely to suffer than people in other American cities. But first, in good health, is technology killing the romance in today's relationships? Experts say if you spend more time staring at your smartphone than gazing into your partner's eyes, the answer, of <laughs> course, might be yes. From smartphones to social media, swipe right or swipe left, it's a whole new world of relationships. Technology has certainly changed romance and romantic relationships, both for the good and for the bad. Psychologist Cheryl Kingsburg says dating sites have changed who we meet and how. Our technology really has broadened our scope of how and where we can meet people. We're no longer limited to our hometowns or even our home states. But technology has made us a little lazy in love. Heart emojis, people, are no love letter. The physical contact of taking somebody to dinner or buying them roses or a nice bottle of wine, enhanced by those flirtatious texts and emails, now you have the full picture. On Valentine's Day and any day, cards and candlelight still count. But remember, you can't hold your partner's hands and your phone. Texting at the dinner table, or if we go out to dinner with our partner and you know we have our cell phone out there and we're focusing more on who's texting and who's emailing than having that intimate conversation. So it's really important that technology have its place, and sometimes that place is either in your purse or in your pocket. It seems like common sense, doesn't it? In a recent survey, 33% of respondents said they've had to compete with their date's device for attention on a first date. No word on how many stuck around for a second date. <laughs> I don't think that many. No. Prince Fielder's goodbye from baseball last summer was emotional, but the 32-year-old is embarking on another adventure now. Fielder, along with his wife, will begin hosting Fielder's Choice. It's a food show. It'll happen sometime in March. It will air on Netflix and Hulu. He told ESPN that he has always wanted to do a food show and began thinking it over in 2015, a year before his retirement. So there you go.